new war front, Somali religious scholars now join the fight to vanquish Al-Shabaab. Tension in Mali, new clashes erupt between Malian soldiers and Tareg rebels. And UNESCO scientists discover a massive water source in arid northern Kenya. Hello and welcome to Africa Live, where we bring you African and global news from all perspectives. I'm Famida Miller. Now, also coming up in the next half hour. Egyptian tourism bears the brunt of political and economic uncertainty. And despite the odds, rugby reigns in Madagascar. We begin this bulletin in Somalia, where only hours after religious scholars declared a religious edict against the Al-Shabaab militant group, a prominent elder has been murdered. The elder, Yusuf Ali Sheikh, was instrumental in the Somali peace process. He was shot dead in Baidoa, south-central Somalia. This comes as the federal government organized a five-day scholars conference in a bid to halt the threat of suicide attacks. The scholars had unanimously declared that Islamic extremism rather is distinct from religious teachings. The federal administration hopes the scholars conference will help tackle the phenomenon of extremism in Somalia and turn the tide against those ideologies. This is a problem that needs a solution. It should get comprehensive treatment. We need to deal with the reasons for extremism, whether ideological or political. We hope to find the intellectual treatment of the phenomenon of extremism. For five days, Muslim scholars have engaged in discussions to come up with solutions to the challenge of extreme religious beliefs. The National Clerics Conference on Tackling the Phenomenon of Extremism in Somalia opened just minutes before twin suicide attacks rocked central Mogadishu on Saturday that killed 18 people. An attack many believe could have been al-Shabaab's response to the conference and even perhaps neutralized public mood. And as such, the conference was grossly overshadowed by this attack. And in claiming responsibility, Al-Shabaab said the village restaurant was a spy den for Westerners. It is inhuman to attack innocent civilians. We strongly condemn such attacks. We now know that their main aim is to kill and maim civilians. Recent escalation of asymmetric attacks provide evidence that the concept of dying for a cause is alive among many Somali youth. For many scholars, though, this ideology is not enshrined in Islamic teachings. As we see, like tribalism is a cancer. This is another cancer, plus cancer, that is destroying our, our people, our society, and the future. And also one of the, uh, I would say, like big obstacle, uh, uh, forming a, a constructive government. Remains to be seen is whether this scholars' conference will come up with intellectual solutions that affect the ideology of extreme actions. Mohammed Irmogi, CCTV. Mogadishu. Let's now have an in-depth look at Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Although the militant group has lost control of various towns and cities, including Mogadishu, it remains influential in the politically volatile state. So who exactly is Al-Shabaab? They're uh, a group which means the youth in Arabic. It's an Al-Qaeda-linked militant group. Al-Shabaab emerged as the youth wing of Somalia's now defunct Union of Islamic Courts in 2006 as it fought Ethiopian forces that had entered Somalia to back the interim government. It's not known how many members belong to the group, but their main interest is the nationalistic battle against the Somali government. In past years, the group's insurgency has been challenged, and in August 2011, the group was pushed out following joint military efforts between Somali soldiers and AU peacekeeping troops. Al-Shabaab is responsible for blocking the delivery of aid from Western relief agencies. The famine left tens of thousands of Somalis dead. Kismayu, a key base for the militants, provided the group with an estimated 35 to $50 million a year from the charcoal trade. Other sources of income include revenue from other terrorist groups, piracy and kidnapping. The groups claimed responsibility for many bombings targeting Somali government officials, Amazon, and perceived allies of the government. 
It's also responsible for attacks in neighboring countries, including a twin blast in Uganda's capital that killed more than 70 people, as well as several attacks in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. In 2008, the U.S. government named al-Shabaab as a foreign terrorist organization and is offering a large bounty for information leading to the capture of its leadership. Let's now cross to Mogadishu, where Mohamed El Morgan is standing by with regard to that story we brought you after the killing of a Muslim cleric. Mohamed, now religious leaders have just issued a religious edit, edict, rather, or a fatwa against Al Shabaab. Is there a link between this move and the killing of the prominent elder? You know, for me, uh, as we understand, a prominent sheikh was killed in central Somalia last night, just hours after the uh, National Clerics Conference on tackling the phenomenon of extremism has been closed officially. And in that, the Muslim clerics adopted a fatwa. A fatwa means a religious judgment or uh, the interpretation, a fair interpretation of issues that are of concern to the society. And such a fatwa can only be declared or be adopted by only renowned Muslim scholars who are fairly educated and who are regarded as both sound and fair in judgment. But we understand the events that have been developing is that of the killing of uh, American born Al Shabaab rebel faction leader. Uh, Omar Hamami, also known as Abu Mansur al Amiriki. We actually don't know whether the killing of al Amiriki and that of the renowned scholar in central Somalia are related to the conference on extremism. But we understand uh, after the closure of the conference, those two gentlemen were killed this morning. Now, Mohammed, you've mentioned there's been the killing of those uh, two men. Um, has Al Shabaab reacted in any way? Well, uh, Al Shabaab have been split since the beginning of this year, and a rebel faction of the Al Shabaab has risen since January this year, headed by the man who is now alleged to have been killed, that is Omar Hamami, alias Abu Mansur al Amiriki, American bomb of Alabama native. Uh, he led a rebel faction, and allied to him were top Al Shabaab leaders, including Sheikh Hassan Dahir Awais, who is now in government custody, and two other gentlemen who belong to the the council, the top council of the Al Shabaab, who were both killed by Al Shabaab two months ago. Uh, right now, though, as it is seems, Al Shabaab has successfully uh, uh, stopped, has successfully destroyed the rebel faction within its rank, and we might not be able to see any more offshoots of Al Shabaab with the killing of Hamami, and before him was Ibrahim Avukani, the second top most Al Shabaab leader, and another one called Sheikh Burhan. But looks like this, the killing of uh, uh, Mansour al Amriki, the American, has been forthcoming. It has been looming. He tweeted several times saying that uh, he, there were a, a, an execution squad hot on his heels. He tweeted several times that he had escaped uh, from the death squad out there to kill him. But this is a man who knew that he was going to die. He dissed the Al-Shabaab in his rap songs that were uploaded in YouTube. He actually recently just denounced the whole of Al-Shabaab and said he's not part of Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda network. All right, Mohammed. now just before we wrap up, let's just go back to that initial conference which has now wrapped up. And uh, what was key there, scholars had said that Islamic extremism is distinct from religious teachings. Now, what impact will the conference and that fatwa have on the realization of peace in Somalia? Well, it may and it may not have. One simple factor that we need to acknowledge is that just as the conference began, like I've mentioned in my report earlier, there was an event that overshadowed hours, just minutes after the conference was opened. Uh, Al Shabaab attacked the village restaurant in central Mogadishu, killing 18 people on Saturday. An event that grossly overshadowed uh, the conference itself. But as it appears now, in strong terms, the Muslim scholars adopted the fatwa, the religious uh, judgment 
on issues of extremism and denounced in strong terms the Al Shabaab, but has the potential to discourage other youth from joining Al Shabaab because those people, those scholars who were involved in the conference, were renowned scholars who are sound and are regarded as fair. Therefore, many youth who might have wanted to join Al Shabaab will not now because of such uh, a fatwa that is now available. Uh, plus, this is the first time such a conference of Muslim scholars from all across Somalia come together to adopt such a common position with regard to the phenomenon of extremism and that of Al-Shabaab. Therefore, uh, we might still not know, but with the escalation of, of attacks, maybe Al-Shabaab's way of saying we are still present and we can still be such a potent force. Uh, they may be out there and wanting to prove a point like it appears last night there was a sheikh, a renowned sheikh, who was killed in central uh, Somalia. But uh, on the other hand, this is a conference that has the potential to sway the thinking and influence the youth from uh, engaging in activities of extremism. All right. Thank you very much, Mohamed Morgue, there live in Mogadishu. Now, three Malian soldiers were wounded in clashes with separatist Tariq rebels on Wednesday. These are the first clashes since the two sides signed a ceasefire deal in June. The fighting took place near the western town of Lair. It also comes a week after President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita was sworn in. The fresh clashes highlight simmering tension as the new president seeks to secure an end to a cycle of uprisings by northern rebels. Now, Africa Live returns just after the short break with more including... UNESCO scientists discover a massive water source in arid northern Kenya. And demanding accountability, CAR leader Sachs Army Chief following a renewed fighting. charged with murder how do you plead not guilty we are receiving uh, some harsh criticisms i therefore salute the kenyan voters for rejecting that black man and then saying that icc is targeting africa do not make it difficult for us this week talk africa delves into africa's love-hate relationship with the international criminal court and poses the question what next, Africa? Welcome back to Africa Live. New water reserves have been discovered in drought-stricken northern Kenya. The discovery of the biggest aquifer yet in Kenya's history could soon put an end to the droughts experienced by residents in the north of the country. The findings were announced at the opening of an international water security conference in Nairobi on Wednesday. Two aquifers, the Lotikipi Basin Aquifer and the Lodwa Basin Aquifer, were identified using advanced satellite exploration technology. The Lotikipi Basin Aquifer is located west of Lake Turkana, the world's largest permanent desert lake. Scientists say the aquifer could supply the country for 70 years. Now, the International Criminal Court on Wednesday adjourned the trial of Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto until Tuesday next week. The adjournment follows a delay in the arrival of a prosecution witness at The Hague. The trial has gripped many across Kenya. There have been fears it could reopen old wounds, but for some survivors of the violence, it's a chance to reflect on how they've rebuilt their lives. CCTV's Robin Aguila has more. Driving to the region of Bant Forest, about 300 kilometers from Nairobi, you come across several destroyed homes. They are grim testimony to the violence that swept this area in early 2008. William Unyancha was among those caught up in it, forced to flee with his family as their home was put to the torch. The 42-year-old still struggles to talk about it. It happened so suddenly. Even now, we still don't understand what happened. It was months 
before Onyancha felt safe enough to come back. And it's taken years for Onyancha and his community to reconcile with the community that attacked them. Politicians and NGOs drove initiated reconciliation efforts among the various communities here. And people say it's been working. Amani, amani. There is peace now. I can even stay at my neighbors until midnight. There is no fighting. We are all one. The scale of destruction in this area and so many others around the country during the post-election violence was unimaginable. Livelihoods were lost and unfortunately so were lives. To give you an idea of the destruction at that time, if you look over the horizon, all the houses with new iron sheds had all been burnt down but have now been rebuilt with government assistance. The scars still remain. Many people here have been watching the trial at The Hague, but none are prepared to discuss openly their hopes on a verdict. Robert Nagela, CCTV, Bunt Forest, Kenya. To South Africa now, where survivors of the Marikana mine shootings are preparing to march in the capital, Pretoria. They want the government to pay their legal fees for the official inquiry into the violence. 46 people were killed at the mine last year, most of them shot by police. Several political parties have joined the march. CCTV's Guy Henderson is there and he sent us this brief update. So several hundred people have already gathered here outside the Caledonian Stadium uh, in Pretoria. The government's arguments in this dispute uh, is that they can't fund both sides of this because it would be uh, seen as a conflict of interest. None of these people here agree with that argument. For them, this constitutes one-sided justice and it isn't fair. And now it's quite interesting to note the way that the marchers uh, that are gathering here uh, are organized. Um, you'll see that they're split into different groups. We've got the Democratic Alliance here. Um, to my left, we've got uh, the Economic Freedom Fighters. That's the party, the newly established party of Julius Malema. And then round here to the back, we've got an IF, uh, the, a party called the IFP. That's because this particular issue is becoming a key political battleground ahead of next year's 2014 elections. But one party that's not here is the African National Congress. Guy Henderson, CCTV, Pretoria, South Africa. The Central African Republic Army Chief's been sacked after forces loyal to the deposed President François Bozizé launched a new offensive. Jean-Pierre Dolwawa will be replaced as Army Chief by General Ferdinand Bombayake, according to a statement read out on state radio. Some 100 people have been killed in the fighting northwest of the capital in the first large-scale operation the former president's forces have staged since he was ousted from power. Medical charity Médecins Sans Frontières warns that the latest fighting has worsened an already precarious humanitarian situation. The government offers its condolences to the families affected and reiterates its support. It calls on the population to support it in the process of disarmament and military withdrawal underway to pacify our country once and for all. As winter draws to a close in South Africa, nowhere does the cold bite as much as in Cape Town, and that's on the western coast of the continent. To alleviate the harsh impact of the winter conditions in informal settlements, specifically where most housing is makeshift, the Chinese community in Cape Town donated blankets and other items. The move is in line with the Chinese objective to increase cooperation and development with their host country. Organized by South Africa Social Development Ministry and Consulate General of the People's Republic of China in Cape Town, the Chinese people donated blankets to help the locals beat the winter chill. The move was warmly received by residents living in the cold environs. We just want to say thank you to all of you, to the Chinese people that hand us today the blankets. We really appreciate that. According to Albert Fritz, the Minister of Social Development, the Chinese people living in Cape Town will make yearly donations to the underprivileged in order to show their solidarity and support. Uh, they always assist us when I ask them to uh, help with the poor. Always. We hope there will be more activities like this to help more people that are in need. 
This is fantastic. We, Consulate General of the PRC in Cape Town, is in full support for this sort of activity. The two parties will continue to work together to ensure they bring comfort and warmth to the vulnerable by providing necessary amenities in material and moral support. Wazir Khamsin, CCTV. In Africa Law, we've got biz coming up, including... Egyptian tourism bears the brunt of political and economic uncertainty. Despite the ongoing political and economic crisis in Egypt, the Egyptian government is stepping up efforts to attract foreign visitors. The tourism industry once garnered at least $12 billion every year. But political unrest has taken its toll and now many hotels are being forced to close. CCTV's Yasser Hakim has more. Going to one of the wonders of the world, the pyramids, you would barely find a tourist in the area. The vendors there talk to you about their dire situation. There is no work. We were making a lot of money before. Now we are sitting, doing nothing. I spent all my money and have no money to pay for my son's school fees. But it's not just the pyramids that is deserted. Even Cairo Museum, the largest in Egypt, it used to attract over 2 million visitors annually. Now barely in the hundreds over the year. And this has started after the uprisings of 2011. After a sharp drop in 2011, tourism rebounded in 2012 and early 2013. The ouster of Mohamed Morsi and the clear out of the Brotherhood sit ins, however, led to a major setback. The effect was felt in all touristic sites, not just Cairo. As far away as Luxor and the Red Sea, where no violence has been reported, 60 hotels have closed down this month for lack of tourism. And in Sharm el Sheikh and Hargada, there was no uh, demonstration, there was nothing. Uh, so there was no need for uh, any slowdown. Now we hear from Russia that uh, uh, Russia is uh, banding and stopping anybody selling tools to Egypt. And then the answer comes, oh, because the people in charge of most of the travel companies in Russia are Turkish. So that's a political issue. It has nothing to do with safety. The government has embarked on a campaign to revive the industry. This includes slashing package prices and hotel rates. There is also a security crackdown. Although tourism has been hit hard, experts feel there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Egypt is back. Egypt uh, uh, have washed its hands out of this. We are very, I'm very optimistic, even though um, I have no work, uh, business is way down. A year of fear, this is the way I call it, a year of fear has gone. Yes, sir, Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. The South African and British governments have launched the SAUK Business Council with the sole mandate to promote focused trade and investment partnership. According to statistics from the two governments, trade targets set by South Africa and the UK have not been met because of global economic pressure. The two countries are strong trading partners and recently held talks in Cape Town in South Africa. Now, CCTV's Travis Andrews has the details. South Africa may be seeking close ties to its partners in BRICS, but Britain remains a key market for South African goods, such as fresh fruit and wine, and it's a relationship the two countries want to nurture. The UK remains the South Africa's largest foreign direct investment source, and uh, we wouldn't mind if it goes up even further. It's good for bilateral relations. So South Africa is the, the biggest market in Africa for the UK, and the UK is the sixth largest export market for South Africa. So clearly we are successful trading partners, but we want to add much more to that. This is the 10th session of the bilateral forum between the two countries. But it's not just trade that's been on the agenda here. On Syria, we have both spoken about the importance of a political solution to resolve the conflict and that the use of chemical weapons in the 21st century is absolutely unacceptable. And on Egypt, we have agreed that it's a crucial time in the country's transition and vital that parties there bridge their differences and develop a shared vision for the future of their country. And on Zimbabwe, we've agreed on the importance of ensuring the country is economically stable 
uh, in the future. The countries have agreed to launch a joint business council to forge stronger business links. But in some areas, they remain far apart. One bone of contention is Britain's proposal to suspend own aid and tighten visa rules. British authorities say talks are ongoing, but that no announcement is imminent. Travis Andrews, CCTV, Cape Town. Now let's have a quick look at the markets where the Nigerian exchange was up 0.41% in early trade, while the JSC in South Africa was up 0.42%. The Nairobi's NEC 20 gaining an initial 0.1%, while the Egyptian EGX 30 remaining unmoved in early trade. Now in sport, football's been dominating sports headlines as the race for a place at next year's World Cup reaches the home stretch. But on the island of Madagascar, it's not the sport of choice. Instead, they're devoted to rugby, even if they don't have a ball. Not your conventional rugby match. It's not even a rugby ball. But these youngsters do not care. They love the game. Ah, ça c'est vrai. Parce que... Yes, rugby is very popular in Madagascar, and this is mainly because football has been regressive for a while now. The standard of football is very low, but rugby is doing well. Ranked 44th in the world, Madagascar has a rich history in rugby with over 22,000 registered players. During the season, league matches in the capital are played every Sunday at the Maki Stadium. Rugby in Madagascar is so popular that it is said the match attendance for an international fixture can outdo that of a football. But even so, the country is yet to appear on rugby's biggest stage, the World Cup. <laughs> rugby faces several challenges here, and everyone has an opinion on what they are. We have to get other jobs because there's no money in playing rugby, even if we love it. <laughs> The Confederation of African Rugby and the World Body support us, but it's not enough. We have no money and infrastructure is poor. I think a problem for my legacy players is that they aren't well conditioned, although they have the speed. Despite that, people on the island have high hopes. Just recently, Madagascar held their place in Africa's top-tier competition, and many hope the squad will qualify for the 2015 World Cup. For these children, some are hoping they too may have a future at playing the game. But for now, they will settle for a proper ball. Celestine Carone, CCTV, in Antananarivo, Madagascar. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Live. You can stay in touch with us on Twitter using the handle at CCTV News Africa. And you can also visit our Facebook page on that CCTV Africa. I'm Famida Miller. Thanks for watching.